Welcome to Masters of Product Management, a show that gives you real-world techniques and cutting-edge strategies to learn, apply, and succeed in product management. Now, here's the master himself, Stephen Haynes. Welcome back, everybody. Today, I want to talk about speed. Speed. For me, it's a given that every company wants to do things faster. They have been wanting to do things faster for decades and decades. Recently, I did a, a podcast on on the use of design sprints, um, and and it's a technique used, technique used by companies to just rapidly vet product concepts. I'm sure that you're familiar with some of these, and of course, more companies are evolving to or just using. Um, iterative development techniques like Agile and other techniques. And it's to get full-blown products or what I call the bits of products out the door. So at my company, Sequent Learning Networks, we really know that large, complex firms have made a shift or some of them are in the process of shifting their focus from more of a linear or waterfall development to Agile or some iterative development. And even some companies are using some hybrid approaches. Um, Recently, I've heard the term wagile, um, where the business ends of end of things and the upfront design gets done up front, maybe in a more linear or slightly iterative way, and then development and validation is done iteratively. And in other companies, um, very fast moving um, firms with especially large web presence and things like that are using this continuous integration, continuous deployment technique, the CICD train, as I call it. Um, so regardless of method, a lot of companies are struggling to implement Agile in a way that is productive and effective for them, Um, both, I guess, from a point of view of the process and even from a staffing point of view. And and this is really the point of this show. And I'd like to introduce you to my guest, John Feely. But um, before we say hello, um, John is currently Director of Product Management at a a pretty good software company in California. Um, and he's got a new role and he's about to stand up a new product management group in his company. And he, he's come into that role as a strong leader and a visionary with uh, probably more than 14 years of experience in product management with background across business functions, sales, marketing, software development, especially with an emphasis on agile transformations, which is why um, I think it's going to be a great show. So John, welcome to the show today. Thank you for having me on, Stephen. I appreciate it. That's great. So we had a really um, interesting and robust bus talk the other day, and we were talking about how companies are shifting to Agile. And you mentioned to me that some companies are struggling, and it's something that I've seen as well. Um, could you describe from your point of view what you're seeing? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough shift um, because the shifting to Agile for any company has been it's – a, it's a culture shift in how you operate – um, you know, you use the term wagile before, and a lot of uh, I've heard a lot of people use that as kind of a tongue in cheek, you know, saying basically saying we're going to do waterfall planning, but agile development. Um, and it's very difficult for typically senior leadership of a company to wrap their brain around the concept that just because you can turn on a dime with agile development doesn't necessarily mean you should always do that. Um, and the difficulty for product management in particular has been, you know, there's a lot that goes into the old waterfall process of doing things in terms of requirements, documents, and vetting all these things out and having all that information up front before development starts. It doesn't make the product, product manager's job any easier. So all you're really, the only benefit you gain is a potential shift in direction when you're using agile development. Um, sorry. No, I, I, I breathed. <laughs> um, oh, okay. That was sort of the sharp, sharp intake of breath before I wanted to say something, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, I mean, it, it just becomes difficult in terms of, uh, of adopting kind of a true agile approach to a marketplace, for example, uh, even from the, from, from, from the executive point of view. Um, some of the other things that I've seen is difficulty is a lot of, uh, in terms of agile process in general, um, a lot of us are using offshore teams now. And the whole point of agile is to, you know, they, they kind of say when you go through like agile boot camps and training, face to face communication is best. Second best is voice to voice, you know, chatting over the phone or something like that. And the, the least 
you know, the least effective form of communication is email. And when you're working with offshore teams, there's typically a huge time difference. And so we, you know, I've seen this in my current company. It was It's really a struggle to adopt offshore effectively and still kind of maintain that nimble, agile approach. We, we lose a lot of time in communications. Um, and unless you have someone that's willing to kind of work those flex hours, whether that be um, you know, on the uh, on the offshore side or onshore here, uh, you know, it's a it's a very difficult balance. It's interesting. Do you you know? It's interesting. There are a couple of key points. Um, number one, that I that I believe I heard you say. Um, number one, there's 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 this leadership mindset that they have this broad base of expectations, um, but they may not be seeing it all. And then there are these cultural dimensions or even organizational design dimensions where it's almost standing in the way. And, you know, as I understand it, you know, you want to develop something quickly and get it tested and validated with a real customer. If somebody's far away or you're out of, you're in a time shift, how do you take advantage of that? And I think that could be problematic. So, so I understand that. Um, But there's, there's something else we, you know, talking about getting some validation, we were talking um, again uh, a week or two ago about, some things that are going on with product managers versus product owners. And, and we see shifts in roles and responsibilities and, and fuzzy boundaries where product managers are doing product owner job and product owner jobs are rudderless and being directed by the development team. I see all this stuff is so variable. And, and I don't know how anybody gets anything done with that degree of inconsistency. What are you seeing? I, I'm seeing that exact, that, that exact thing. Um, right now, I think th- because agile is, you know, quote unquote new to a lot of, uh, a lot of leadership teams, they're struggling to figure out what role the product owner really is. Um, there is some overlap of product owner with what product managers typically do, at least in, in my experience. Um, and there's kind of an ongoing, I don't know if it's an ongoing debate necessarily, but it's, it's really an open question as to, are product owners and product managers interchangeable? Is you know is it the same role or should it be two separate roles? Um, and and I think the answer is a little bit of a cop out, but I think it depends on your organization, and it also depends on the size of your company. Obviously, if you're a smaller company, I think you can definitely you can definitely get away with the product owner and product manager being that same individual. Um, but as you grow into a, a, just an enterprise size you know, company, several hundred employees, maybe you have a, a fairly mature product and, and, and you know, product team. Um, you really, I think, need two distinct roles. Um, and it depends on how your company is also organized. Um, I can give you an example from, from my current life. Our product owners are basically embedded with the development teams specifically. And which sounds great on paper, uh, you know, because now you have this this product owner that's just lock and step with uh, with the development team, uh, you know, through everything that they do. But that person is actually functioning more like a project manager or even a BA, a business analyst in that case. Their role basically becomes just managing the dev team day to day. They're down in the weeds. They're writing requirements. They're answering very specific questions or making some decisions. They're not one step above looking at it from a market point of view. And that's where I see the product manager role being separate. They need to be out of the weeds um, and they need to be looking at market trends and doing the competitive analysis. And, and they can't be embedded with that team day to day, you know, doing standups necessarily. They certainly can participate, uh, and they're a valuable component of that uh, of sprint planning and you know product definition. Uh, but really, that product owner role becomes a, a very functional scheduling role um, because they are embedded directly with a specific team. Yeah, you know what's interesting is that in some companies, um, when what this is what we've seen when you have a a product manager who gets so stuck into the product owner role they don't get a chance to get out of the weeds and they become extremely f- tactical. They get very, very frustrated. Um, 
and and even though they're called product managers, they're literally doing that that development um, team hand handholding. This this one thing else that I that that we've started to see as well, where some companies as they're beginning to mature are recognizing they can't have two human beings associated with the same product, and they're trying to find some hybridized approach where the the product manager may may not do a daily stand up. Um, and they may not be releasing things as rapidly because they just can't. There's a lot of integration and things have to go along. So they're doing some of these, their, their weekly meetings, either in person or even remotely, but maybe only doing a couple a week because they've got to be out and about and seeing customers and things like that. Can you comment on that? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think you kind of nailed it in the, the way I kind of equate it, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, that product owner, like I said, is, a, is kind of aligned with the team where I look at product managers being aligned with a marketplace or a customer or, uh, you know, and that's that to me is the best place to kind of start delineating. OK, here's what the product manager is supposed to be responsible for. Here's what I expect out of my product owners. And certainly there's going to be some overlap in there uh, in terms of specific you know, requirements generation and, and, and things like that, because obviously there has to be some collaboration there between those two. I think those two roles need to be kind of connected at the hip, as it were, um, because I envision I envision multiple product managers working with maybe a product owner. Uh, if you have an organization like mine, we have siloed development teams. We have specific teams that are responsible for specific functions of the application. Um, where a product owner, like I said, is assigned to each one of those teams. Me as a product manager, if I have very specific requirements or if I have a specific market need for an application, for example, I may require work from three of six teams as, as an example. So I'm going to go to three different product owners and say, okay, from your team, I need this. From your team, I need this. And from your team, I need that. And each of those product owners being the experts with their team specifically in that area, they can kind of figure out the, the down in the weeds details. So um, that's, you know, that that's kind of where I, I start to separate the two. Sure. Ways. Sure. Um, so, um, that's that's one set of, of things I wanted to talk about. And I had another because, of course, we have an agenda here. Um, <laughs> we have to. So it could be efficient, of course, right? Because the, the name of the, the game is speed. <laughs> and we can't do that many takes because we can't iterate. So and, anyway, um, but we were, we were talking about product requirements. And I know you mentioned it uh, just a little bit ago. And... You know, I've heard people say, especially in, in big companies that are trying to minimize documentation and these artifacts are saying, we don't need a PRD. The PRD is dead. And I, and I, and I say, well, maybe like the 3,000 page of PRD is dead, but we've got to have some baseline for non-functional requirements and things like that. How, how, what's going on today from your point of view with respect to this PRD? So I look at a PRD and I, I, I do agree. I think the days of the 3,000 page document that no one wants to read are dead. I wouldn't read um, it. Thankfully, I, 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 I don't. And I don't want to write it, for that matter. Um, I, I think with the Agile, in respect to Agile, uh, there are certain levels of, uh, of requirement. And so the way my company looks at them is they're called epics. And so an epic can be any size and an epic you can kind of think of as a project. And so an epic is comprised of multiple features themselves. And so say an epic is a web application that's supposed to, you know, collect someone's information and add them to a mailing list as an example. So I would break that up into several features, say, okay, I need a feature where it collects the, you know, form fields and I need a feature for a submit button each of those features are then made up of user stories. And so that's what, so you kind of get that waterfall effect of, of, of breaking down an application or a requirement. And so that's where I see PRD kind of replacing or, or Epic kind of replacing PRD in that sense, where that's where you would generate a lot of this detail and say, okay, I have this big Epic. I need a web application that collects all this information and so on and so forth. Um, now, does that mean 
you know, you're not going to write any sort of external document, whether it's a Word doc, PowerPoint, what, you know, whatever. No, probably not, because odds are you're going to have some sort of one pager type materials that you're going to have to probably get as the product manager, get buy in from business, get buy in from executive teams and marketing teams, whoever your stakeholders are. Um, so you're probably going to have a lot of artifacts that I that I would argue you could kind of combine together and call the PRD. Um, but I think you're right. The, the days of the 3,000 page document. There, there, are, are two, there are two dimensions that I wanted to comment on. One is in, in one of our product management workshops, we, we came up with this notion to capture this a thing called an epic. But, you know, the, the epic, um, we actually we came up with the term uh, uh, user storybook. And what we did was we said, you know, you can create a user story, which is a, a depiction of one little journey or mini journey. Um, and, you know, when you write a book, which I have a little bit of experience in, um, you, you write a chapter and then you write another chapter and then you realize that there was something that you had to change in the previous chapter. So you go back and forth and back and forth. So you're in this continuous mode of editing. And that this idea is you still want to create a complete storybook, which really captures the entire journey. So that actually could be the the epic that you refer to. And I know that epic is used um, in the agile world. Um, it's just the, the idea that a story is, it can be edited over time. Um, and I think that's important. But on the other, on the other side of the stick, I think that somebody, and I think somebody in product needs to still own things like complete you know, performance and capacity and safety and security and stuff like that at the non-functional level, which may or may not be, I don't think they're captured necessarily in the user story. So do you, do you have any sense of how that's done um, in an agile world? No, I, I, I agree with, yes, the notion that it does need to be owned. And, and, and I, in my current world, uh, it's just expected that the product managers all shoulder that responsibility themselves uh, to make sure that security and 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 all the, all the performance is just inherent in into the application. Um, part of it is also, you know, in going back to our the initial discussion of speed, um, you know, that we have a s- separate departments set up for. Uh, load testing and things like that. And, and especially my current company, we are very peak driven. We have uh, holiday peaks drive our entire company. Um, and so, you know, there are eight months out of the year where we have very, li- not very little traffic, but much lower traffic. And then as we get closer to holidays, you know, Christmas is coming up right now, we see a huge, huge spike on our system. Um, and same thing with Valentine's Day and Mother's Day. So um, performances of, we have actually have a performance lab set up and making sure that, uh, you know, our systems will still be standing, uh, under, you know, peak loads. Yeah. So that, that's, and that's important because it's inherent in, in the business, which we're not talking about, but maybe people can guess. Um, I, I wanted to talk about something else, but I also wanted to be cognizant of our time because, um, you know, we try to keep these casts, um, at about 20 minutes or less just because, of the short attention span theater, people have things to do. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm going to skip over the thing related to continuous integration and continuous deployment, but I might want to take that up um, as another topic with you, possibly some other people as well, because I think that there are some companies who are operating in that model. Um, um, it's, it's amazing. And I think that we can have conversations like this, and I hope that people are continuing to have conversations like this because, um, we, we, you know, we have a lot of opportunities in front of us, the opportunities to go faster and to be, uh, more, I, I like to say the word fleet afoot, which is, you know, this, like the, the analogy of a sports team and you, you encounter obstacles and you're pushing along and, and then you pivot and you move. And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do that kind of blocking and tackling on the competitive playing field. And I think that um, iterative product development techniques allow us to do that, but an organization has to adapt from a holistic perspective. And it can't just be an edict from the top of the company that says, thou shalt go faster and not provide all the enabling tools in terms of organizational design. Exactly. And that's, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, right. So we are, that's why we were doing this because um, I think that we were, we were finding a, you know, some equivalent thought on that. Um, but I, I will leave this with our listeners and that is um, do keep 
um, this conversation going. I am, I, I'm hoping that others will want to join in in the conversation and reach out to me, um, either through LinkedIn or um, through my company's uh, contact us page at Sequent Learning Networks, because what I really want to do is I want to expose some of these things. I want to um, almost take a therapeutic uh a stance on this and say, listen, this is an imperfect world and we have a lot of different challenges. And if people have some tricks or some techniques or some things that they've learned that help them adopt and move quickly and make their customers happy and make great products, I'd love to hear from you. And I really hope that this um, is the first in a line of, of, of broadcasts that we do that really focus on this. And with that, I thank uh, John for joining us today. And um, hopefully we'll hear from him and perhaps other colleagues and some of you out there um, as we focus um, our effort on agile transformation in Masters of Product Management. Let's see you next time. Bye-bye. Looking for resources and best practices in product management? Just go to Sequent Learning Networks to gain access to real-world tools that can make a difference. It's all there at sequentlearning.com.